This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Chinese President Xi Jinping inspects industry in Luzhou City. Militants overrun an army base in northeastern Nigeria, killing more than 30 soldiers. And the Indian government appeals to citizens not to panic, even as COVID-19 infections spike. Welcome to Africa Live on CGTN with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. We'll bring you the details on those stories in just a moment. But first, here's Ramanyang with the day's business headlines. Rama. That's right, Beatrice. Here's what's coming up in the course of the hour. South Africa's MTN and a consortium led by Vodafone and Kenya's Safaricom are the two bidders for operating licenses in Ethiopia. And Egypt is setting its eyes on reconstruction projects in Libya. We'll have the details on those stories and lots more coming your way in the course of the hour. For now, let's start with the latest in current affairs with Beatrice. Rama, thank you. Chinese President Xi Jinping continues his visit to the Guangxi Shuang Autonomous Region in the south of China. Earlier, he was in the city of Liuzhou, visiting an engineering company and local food producers. He is seeking to learn more about reform and innovation, as well as the modernization of manufacturing in the city. Liuzhou is the second largest city in Guangxi and its main industrial and transportation center. So Yunfei has more. When you walk on the streets in Liuzhou, it's easy to find the city's iconic snack, stinky luosifen or stinky sour snail noodles. The snack gained sudden popularity thanks to industrialization. In his second day visit to Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region, President Xi Jinping came to Liuzhou. Now having the taste of stinky luosifen is a must, but his trip is more about industrial upgrade. Stinky noodles are no longer a product of roadside stand. In this factory, the snacks are packed on production lines and the packages are sold countrywide. Last year, the city of Liuzhou has made a stinky noodle revenue of 11 billion yuan. President Xi once stressed that China should strengthen its real economy. And this factory he inspected is one of many examples of Liuzhou's efforts on intellectualization. Liuzhou is a major industrial city in South China. The city has provided environment for local companies to foster new development engine for modern manufacturing. During his inspection, President Xi also paid a visit to this heavy lift company, Liu Gong Machinery. The company witnessed the country's infrastructure development in the past six decades. In the 1960s, Liu Gong produced the country's first modernized wheel loader. Today, the company has expanded its network to dealers from more than 100 countries. Now the company is striving to develop its core technology. Now China has carried out a new development plan. The 14th five-year plan aims for a modernized economy by upgrading the country's manufacturing. President Xi urged local authorities and companies to find paths of transformation. The president's second day in Guangxi has provided a fundamental guideline of high-quality development. Zhao Yunfei, CGTN, Liuzhou, Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region. Insurgents in northeastern Nigeria have reportedly killed about 30 soldiers. Meanwhile, kidnappers have attacked a university in northern Nigeria and abducted uh, several students. And as CGTN's Philly Haza reports, the West African nation has seen a spike in insecurity in some parts of the country in recent months. The attackers in the northeast reportedly disguised themselves as members of the Nigerian army, gaining entrance into the military camp in Mainok, Brunei State. The military is yet to officially comment on the attack, but according to local sources, the nature of the onslaught bears the hallmarks of Boko Haram insurgents, a group that has waged war against the Nigerian state for more than a decade now. Human Rights Watch reports that more than 30,000 people have died and 2 million more have been displaced as a result, as a result of similar attacks from the terrorists so far. In a separate incident, many students have been reportedly kidnapped from a University of Agriculture in Makodi, Benue State. It comes less than a week after about 20 students were abducted from another university in a nearby region in Kaduna State. Three of them were found dead and the rest are still missing. Since December, Nigeria has been dealing with rising cases of kidnapping, especially from schools by unknown gunmen, popularly called bandits. 
President Mohamed Buhari has condemned these attacks and urged all security agencies to bring the activities of criminals and insurgents to a halt while restoring peace across the country. Phil Ihaza, CGTN, Abuja. Top Indian health officials are appealing to people not to panic as new coronavirus cases hit a record peak for a fifth day. Countries are sending medical supplies as the country battles a severe new wave that's been inundating hospitals and pushing crematoriums to work at capacity. The Indian government says it is doing all it can to boost the supply of oxygen and vaccines across the country. It has ordered all industries to divert supplies for medical use. Timothy Aldrich has more. And here's a warning to our viewers, you may find some of these pictures disturbing. Cars line up outside the Sikh temple in Delhi for free oxygen. What was a place of sanctuary is now a last line of defense for patients suffering from severe symptoms. We are trying to save the life of all these people who are this agate and they are all religious are not accepted by hospitals. From government hospitals also and private hospitals, deny to admit them. Those patients are coming, coming to this Gurdwara. Uh, we are trying to their, save their health uh, life. Oxygen has been in short supply amid the country's latest surge. It sent India scrambling to search for more. Elsewhere, another shortage, places to cremate bodies. It's meant leaving the pyres burning full time and constructing more. A lot of bodies are coming. There's no space inside the crematorium. There were 34 cremators, but still we had to make 20 more platforms to meet needs. Vaccines have also been in short supply, a problem challenging the rollout of doses in a country known as the world's pharmacy. Several nations have pledged aid for India over the past week. The latest, the U.S., which said Sunday it will partially lift a ban on the export of raw materials needed in the manufacturing of vaccines as well as sending equipment. Health experts are questioning how India has been so underprepared for this wave. A nationwide lockdown was first ordered over a year ago, and the country had since been struggling under a steady rise in cases. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is facing criticism for letting India drop its guard. On Sunday, he said the country is facing a serious problem. We were confident. Our spirits were up after successfully tackling the first wave of COVID-19, but this storm has shaken the nation. The question is what steps will the government take in response? Lockdown measures have been put in place in several parts of India. Delhi on Sunday extended restrictions for another week. But what? if anything, can be done to address the issues the country faces that has left many gasping for breath. Timothy Ulrich, CGTN. Well, while the Indian government is appealing for calm, some are blaming it for the current crisis. The Modi government is being blamed not only for failing to prepare for a second wave of the pandemic, but also creating a false sense that India had defeated COVID-19. We were confident. Our spirits were up after successfully tackling the first wave of COVID-19, but this storm has shaken the nation. To combat this storm, India has reached out for support to other countries. The second wave of pandemic has caught India unawares. The nation is gasping for breath as there is a major shortage of oxygen. Singapore has sent four cryogenic oxygen tanks and medical supplies, while Britain is sending oxygen concentrators and ventilators to help save lives. To control the situation, it is very important that as many or more people recover as the new cases coming in. This will also help in reducing the demand for oxygen. When the demand for oxygen reduces, only then will the gap between the supply and demand be met. Yesterday, oxygen supply was a bit smoother as compared to previous days, and I hope it will get completely smooth in a day or two. India's second wave is fueled by laxity on the part of central and the state governments. While people's gatherings are restricted to 50 or 100, the political rallies see thousands gather in the states where elections are being held. 
Another super spreader event is the religious fair Kum Mela, where thousands gather to bathe in the river Ganges. All this has led to a false sense of belief that India has beaten the virus. If the leaders are doing a lot of rallies and protests and dharnas without any mask, it, it speaks volumes about it. So it is very important for us to understand that these rallies should either stop or the people should take proper precautions of social distancing and wearing the mask. While the governments took the lull before the storm lightly, the people too are not masking up. This volunteer is urging people to wear their masks. Experts have raised concerns about the spread of more contagious variants of the disease after thousands participated in political rallies and religious festivals. The jubilation of beating the virus is over. Ravinder Bhava, CGTN, Delhi. The World Health Organization is reviewing two Chinese coronavirus vaccines for emergency use licensing. Vaccine candidates from Sinopharm and Sinovac Biotech are now in the final stage of the World Health Organization's emergency use list review. A final decision is expected this week. It approved the vaccines will enter the COVAX facility. This is a World Health Organization-led initiative aimed at providing equal access to vaccines for low and middle income countries. Meanwhile, several African countries have received donations of Chinese-developed vaccines. This comes as the continent looks to vaccinate its population against the coronavirus. CGTN's Robert Nagila has more. There are four COVID-19 vaccines currently manufactured by China and approved for use. Two of these vaccines have been developed by subsidiaries of the China National Pharmaceutical Group, known as Sinopharm. A third vaccine, known as Coronavac, has been developed by biopharmaceutical company Sinovac. The fourth vaccine, approved for general use, is from CanSino Biologics. Both vaccines by Sinopharm and Sinovac are inactivated vaccines. Now, what this means is they use the killed version of the virus that causes the disease. Both can also be stored at standard refrigerator temperatures of between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius, making them ideal for the African continent. Now, to date, China has donated over 6 million vaccine doses to at least 23 African countries, among them Egypt, Morocco, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia and Senegal. So far, Morocco has received the highest number of vaccine doses from Sinopharm, 1.5 million doses and is expecting an additional order of about 43 million doses, while Egypt has received 650,000 vaccine doses from the company. Now, earlier this year, China pledged it would provide free vaccine aid to 53 countries, including 27 African nations. Back to you. Robert Nagila there. Ugandan scientists are concerned about increasing cases of malaria drug resistance. They say the malaria parasite is becoming more resistant to treatment because of self-medication by some patients. CGTN's Hilary Ayesiga tells us more. Amina Bazarama can now smile with her son. Her son has been discharged from the hospital after battling bouts of malaria for a week. malaria plus plus plus. We've been struggling with malaria for a long time. Before we were admitted, we had visited several other hospitals and the findings indicated that my child had high malaria and bacteria infection, but he was not getting better. Health workers say drug resistance in malaria treatment is now common. In about 30% uh, of the patients we get, they come in with resistance already due to the numerous and various types they have used before coming to hospitals. A similar concern has also been highlighted in a recent Lancet report which showed that drug-resistant malaria is gaining a foothold in Africa. Ugandan health workers are now discouraging patients from self-medicating so as to reduce incidences of drug resistance. Self-medication is the biggest complicator of all treatments that we give. So we strongly advise patients or people when they have signs and symptoms of malaria that is they can come and have a test done. Figures from Uganda's health ministry show that the country registers 25,000 cases of malaria per day. Doctors here say they treat 20 patients daily suffering from malaria. They are now encouraging the locals to use preventive measures like mosquito nets. 
the government is now promoting outdoor residue spraying and distribution of treated bait nets to keep the disease at bay. Mosquito on themselves, there are still plenty. So we are calling upon the people, let's try and work on the water lodges, your environment. If there are bushes, clear the bushes. If there are water lodges in the compound, make sure there are no water drain, the water drainages are clear. If at all your house has got windows and in the evening you close the windows so that mosquitoes not enter into the house and you sleep under the mosquito net. Through a campaign dubbed Under the Net, the government has so far distributed over 27 million treated bed nets. Health workers are now hoping that this and many other initiatives will help Uganda become malaria-free. Hilary Isga, CGTN, Kampala, Uganda. You're watching Africa Live, still ahead on the program. Food prices in Nigeria rise sharply. And DR Congo's new government to focus on security, electoral reforms and infrastructure evolution. Africa is a continent of diversity with varied climates and enchanting geography and a people so distinct but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Africa Live. Find your voice. Let's now turn to Nigeria, where the country has seen a rise in the cost of food. Conflicts and insecurity are among the reasons behind this increase. The UN says violence in the northeast has forced farmers to flee and leave their fields. As food prices increase, more Nigerians are facing hunger. Tessem Akende reports. 50-year-old Abdul Hamid Musa and his household have been cabbage farmers for 30 years now. He says his yields have reduced because of security concerns. We don't plant as much as we usually do because the kidnappers and insurgents are chasing us away from our ancestral lands. Sometimes we stay away from the farm for two to three weeks for our own safety. Musa is one of the many Nigerians living in rural communities who rely on subsistence farming to combat hunger. The United Nations says escalating violence in northern Nigeria is forcing farmers to flee their homes and abandon their fields and sources of income. As a result, prices of food are on the rise across the country. For people in this market, they say this has increased hunger in the land. Transporting foodstuff from farms to the markets has become a problem because of insecurity. Seriously, food prices are too high. My family and I are suffering at the moment. We can't seem to afford anything. Seriously. Analysts say the government needs to improve security across the country to prevent the current situation from getting worse. I believe the only way government can assist in this situation is to ensure that farmers feel secured. That is to say farmers are secured such that they can go to their farms and farm freely using the mechanized form of farming. That in turn will have a ripple effect. It will assist the farmers to have boost in production. The government says it is making an effort to tackle insecurity by deploying more security personnel to troubled areas. It says it will not relent until peace is restored in all the troubled parts of the country. The hope is that these efforts are enough to provide an enabling environment for farmers like Musa to help prevent a food crisis in the country. Tassim Akendi, CGTN Jos, Nigeria. 
Let's hear more now from Olo Sib, a senior researcher and assessment and monitoring advisor for the World Food Program's West and Central Africa Regional Bureau. He's joining us from Dakar in Senegal. Sib, thank you for joining us on Africa Live. Now, we do understand that Nigeria has, has seen a rise in the cost of food. What is the status of food price increases in Nigeria? Uh, good afternoon and thank you. I mean, the, 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 the Nigeria is not just alone, you know, we have an overall increase of food price in our region, West and Central Africa region. And um, of, of today, we can see an increase of more than 39% of the price compared to the five years average. And we are seeing more and more, you know, part of the region where access to food today it's becoming a critical issue for thousand million of household because food price has gone up. Of course, various drivers have been uh, identified as planning why food price is going up. And in the case of Nigeria in particular, we have, of course, a very difficult economic situation where the local currency, so the Nigerian Naira, um, fell and have been um, substantially depreciated and on top of that we have seen uh, an increase um, an increase um, an escalation of the conflicts in a, in the northern part of Nigeria with millions of people uprooted displayed and we can also see the conflict with right. different armed groups um, taking over different trade routes controlling the route increasing the transaction cost and therefore we have seen uh, food price going up in different markets in the region. So let's talk about that uh, difficult economic situation in Nigeria. How does the continued uh, uh, rise in prices affect the most vulnerable members of society? Now, with the with the with the COVID we, we have seen uh, countries and in the case of Nigeria uh, various uh, restrictions are put in place and, uh, and we can mention here the fact that um, um, internal movements were, 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 were restricted. We can mention that uh, border, uh, border where land borders were still or are still, are still closed and, and therefore the, the, the regular exchanges, the regular trade right in this region or in Nigeria has been um, heavily uh, are affected and even before uh, we get uh, to the COVID, already the Nigerian economy situation was very very difficult, with the naira falling and uh, substantially against the U.S. dollar, and uh, many 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 Nigerian has lost their purchasing power, their income, uh, as a result of uh, the inflation in the country, as a result of um, the different restriction measures taken to control. Uh, the coronavirus, and then you have now a double effect of price going up, and at the same time, people income are uh, really going down. And we have been looking at many farmers in Nigeria right. uh, living out of uh, mostly livestock, selling goat uh, to buy cereal, uh, selling goat to buy millet, and as of today, they will have to sell two goats at least to get one bag of may uh, maize. And last year, the same time of the year, with one bag of, 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 of with one goat, those farmers were able to buy two or even more bag of rice in the market. All right. Uh, Solo Sib joining us there from Dakar in Senegal. Uh, thank you. Well, let's now go to Chad, where the military council has appointed Albert Pahimi Padakte as the prime minister. This comes after the death of President Idris Deby. Padakte's appointment has been challenged by opposition members who still term the formation of the military council a coup. Padakke has uh, served in the same docket before, uh, be between 2016 and 2018 and was a renowned ally of the late Derby who ruled Chad for three decades. He also held uh, ministerial positions in finance, trade, mines, energy and oil ministries. Well, remaining in, in Chad... The ruling military council had earlier rejected a call uh, for uh, the government uh, 
for t talks by rebels. Military spokesperson Azim Bamendao Aguna says the government will continue attacking the rebels blamed for the assassination of Idris Deby. Chad has asked Niger to arrest the leader of the rebels, Mahamat Mahadi Ali, who is suspected to be hiding there now. Here's CGTN's Wan Jamungai with more on that. Well, let's now look at developments in the DRC, uh, where the Prime Minister of the Democratic Republic of Congo says security, electoral reforms, and uh, infrastructure development are the key areas that the new uh, government will focus on. Uh, Sama Lukonde pledged to improve the lives of the Congolese people when he presented the government's program to Parliament. Here's CGTN's Chris Ochamringa with more details. Prime Minister Sama Lukonde told MPs that ending insecurity in Eastern DRC will be one of the government's top priorities. His announcement comes a week after the DRC President Felix Chisekedi signed a military cooperation pact with his Kenyan counterpart Uhuru Kenyatta. Under the deal, Kenyan troops will support the DRC to end the fighting in the east of the country. The Premier's announcement follows an increase in the killing of civilians in the eastern territory of Beni the construction of roads, boosting agricultural capacity, and the implementation of electoral reforms will be the other priority areas. The program was endorsed by a majority in parliament. That effectively means that the new government, called the Sacred Union of the Nation, has been approved. The government was supposed to be inaugurated last Friday, but the ceremony was postponed after some MPs allied to President Chisekedi threatened to boycott the event. The MPs were unhappy with the composition of the new government and the continued killing of civilians in eastern DRC. The DRC's new government was formed after the president ended a power-sharing deal he signed with his predecessor Joseph Kabila in 2019 over power struggles that caused a political crisis. Chris Sochamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. The United Nations says it is doubling its efforts in supporting South Sudan's peace process. The new head of the United Nations mission in South Sudan, Nicholas Hayson, says the implementation of the country's peace deal will be a priority. CGTN's Patrick Oyet reports. The new head of the UN mission in South Sudan says the country is entering a new phase of an end to war and a beginning for peace. Nicholas Haysom is urging the former warring parties to fully implement the country's 2018 peace deal. He says South Sudanese people now have higher expectations for durable peace in the country. He promises that the United Nations mission in South Sudan will continue helping in the country's peace deal implementation. The UN says it will work with regional and international partners to provide stability and ultimately secure prosperity for all South South Sudanese people. It is urging South Sudanese political leaders to do more too. We are here to help the South Sudanese and we regard that as a privilege. But that durable peace and prosperity can only be made by the South Sudanese themselves. The United Nations is promising to support constitution making, security, justice, economic reforms and preparations for elections. The 2018 South Sudan's peace deal provides for elections to be held six months before the end of the transitional period that is supposed to be in 2022. However, analysts say the implementation of the peace deal is moving slower than earlier planned and elections may be delayed. The UN is urging all parties to the peace deal to exert efforts to fully implement the peace agreement. Patrick Coyette, CGTN. Juba, South Sudan. Meanwhile, Ugandan police are investigating the killing of a South Sudanese general, Abraham Wani, who fled the country several years ago. According to police in Kampala, General Wani was attacked at his home in the suburbs of the capital. He was allegedly stabbed by people speaking Arabic and later died in hospital. General Wani was formerly a soldier in South Sudan's President Salva Kiir's government. He fled to Uganda in 2016 after accusing the government of extrajudicial killings. Wani sought asylum in Uganda. He had lived at the Kiriandongo refugee settlement before moving to the capital Kampala. Police say General Wani had previously survived two assassination attempts. 
No one has been arrested as yet, but police say they have launched investigations on the uh, suspected murder. Uh, we are still trying to uh, establish uh, leads that can help us to crack this investigation. Uh, what we can simply inform you that uh, the late Brigadier General uh, was formerly a security advisor to the governor of Central Equatorial State uh, in South uh, uh, Sudan. And uh, he was also once a deputy governor of Yei River State. And it is in 2016 that he came to Uganda for treatment uh, following a site, uh, an eyesight problem, but never returned uh, to South Sudan. So his family uh, followed him up to Uganda. And uh, at one time in the year 2018, uh, he, while uh, staying in the Kiriandong refugee settlement, uh, he, he survived uh, two assassination attempts against him uh, while at uh, uh, this uh, refugee settlement. And uh, this was a matter that was taken up by the Office of the Prime Minister and uh, UNHCR. Well, let's now go to Rama Nyang for a look at the day's business news, Rama. Thank you very much, Peter. This is what's coming up in business. South Africa's MTN and a consortium led by Vodafone and Kenya's Safaricom are the two bidders for operating licenses in Ethiopia. And Egypt sets its eyes on reconstruction projects in Libya. The details coming up shortly. It's new, it's different, it's a challenge. Woo! It's really exciting. <laughs> Over the last 14 hours of rain. Let's start this segment in North Africa, specifically in Egypt, where Prime Minister Mustafa Mabuli has wrapped up his visit to Libya. During that particular visit, several arrangements were agreed to between the two governments. Libya, of course, is starting the process of rebuilding an economy shattered by years of violence and chaos in the wake of the 2011 ouster of the country's then leader, Muammar Gaddafi. Here's Yasser Kim with the details from Cairo. It's the largest Egyptian delegation to visit Libya in more than a decade. And this was reflected in the slightly less than a dozen business deals that were struck between the two neighbors. They range from infrastructure to real estate, energy, health and medical supplies. Egypt is to support Libya in its rebuilding process after a decade of instability. We have signed some very important memoranda of understanding in several fields. Egypt is prepared to transfer all the experience gained over the past six years in all fields of development. The huge development that Egypt is witnessing and gained international recognition was implemented by Egyptian hands. We are keen to share this experience with our Libyan brothers. Two agreements attracted the most attention. First is allowing Egyptian labor back to Libya. There were three million Egyptian workers in Libya in 2010. They had to return home due to the unrest and violence. When they go back to Libya, they will add to the remittances sent by the expatriates. Last year's remittances were $26 billion without anything from Libya. When we add to that from 2 million workers in Libya, it will help boost the economy. It will also help reduce the unemployment rates in Egypt. Another breakthrough concerns restructuring Libya's civil aviation sector and promoting air freight cooperation. 
It's important to provide training, create skilled workers, improve maintenance and upgrade the air freight infrastructure. It's very important as it will ease the movement of passengers and goods between both countries, which will increase bilateral trade and investments. Bilateral trade had dropped by 80 percent since 2011, while Libyan investments fell from $10 billion to less than half a billion in the same period. Cairo hopes this would be a new chapter to restore the strong economic ties. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. MTN Group and a consortium led by Vodafone Group have put in bids for telecommunication licenses over in Ethiopia. Now, earlier on Monday, Kenya's largest telecommunication services provider, Safaricom, said it was bidding for one license jointly with Vodafone and the UK carrier's South African unit, Vodacom Group. Ethiopia is Africa's most populated nation after Nigeria. It's poised to expand its GDP by over 8% next year that ideally would actually make it the fastest growing economy on the continent that's even as the country is still battling a whole range of crises from a civil conflict in the northern tigray region that has threatened prime minister Abiy ahmed's economic transformation agenda with a population of over 110 million people and only 50.7 million subscribers the country is seen as one of the world's last major untapped markets as far as telecommunication services are concerned Still in the Horn of Africa, Somalia's economy is forecast to recover to grow by at least 2.9% this year and 3.2% in 2022 after this pandemic-induced slump. Somalia's real GDP growth was 2.9% back in 2019, but it contracted by 1.5% just last year. Now, apart from the pandemic, the Horn of Africa state was also hit by severe flooding and a widespread infestation of desert locusts just last year. Growth has also been reduced by, affected rather, by reduced foreign direct investment as investors have shied away from contentious elections that are on hold. CGTN spoke to the Director General of Somalia's Finance Ministry. Suleiman Omar highlighted the country's current economic situation and the efforts put in place to revive the economy from the impact of the pandemic. The ministry tried to take steps. The first uh, item, that the, ter the first step that we, we took was that we assessed the severity of the shock, economic shock that has been hit to the country. After an assessment, we come up a plan that we can at least, how we can reduce at least and how can effectively we address the shocks, especially the COVID-19, which, which was uh, new to even to the world. We try to at least by the time that we make an assessment, when the lockdown already started, we come up at least to reduce the amount of tax on commodities, especially those, the items that essential, essential is for the life of the society. We are optimistic in the government for in 2021, 2022. And uh, since the development of the COVID vaccine, we, we think that you know, the economy will at least revive and we are optimistic that when the pandemic is lifted over, then the economy will be reviving. And we still keep in our re economic reforms. On to a much broader issue now. Delegates from the 19 member states of the Union of African Shippers Councils have been holding a week-long conference in the capital of the DRC. Their discussions over there focused on ways of fast-tracking the implementation of a single market for goods and services under the African continental free trade area. Here's Chris Ochamringa with the details from Kinshasa. It's a typical day at the port of Dar es Salaam. The port handles millions of tons of cargo annually. Seaports like these are essential in promoting trade. The main reason business leaders in the cross-border movement of goods in West and Central Africa have been holding discussions in the DRC capital, Kinshasa. It's important that we harmonize all the charges to ensure that what is applicable in Abidjan is applicable in Dakar, is applicable in Tema, in Lome and any other port. Currently what we see is that some things that they wouldn't charge in Tema, they're charging in Abidjan. African enterprises face serious hurdles when exporting products on the continent than elsewhere in the world because of the high costs of transportation, numerous control points, and poor infrastructure. 
the newly elected president of the Union of African Shippers Councils, Patient Saiba Tambwe, has aligned his mission with that of the African Union to promote a single market on the continent. The first priority is to med actions so that we can decrease the cost of transport. Because uh, uh, nowadays, sh shipping lines, they are increasing the cost of transport, uh, transport on their need, on their own. There is no discussion between uh, 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 some uh, public structures with them. So what we need as priority, we need really to revamp the committee of negoci negotiation committee with shipping lines so that we can decrease the cost of transport. The agreement seeks to create a single market for goods, services and investments across the continent. It's in line with a free trade agreement called the African Continental Free Trade Area, AFCFTA. The agreement seeks to create a single market for goods, services and investments across the continent. Since the 1st of January 2021, the AFCFTA went operational, so actually, as of now, countries are trading under the AFCFTA, despite some technical outstanding issues that have been scheduled to be completed by June of this year. This push for economic integration is a brainchild of the African Union, which seeks to create jobs and reduce poverty across the continent. Chris Sochamringa, Kinshasa. Tunisian authorities have announced a range of relief measures to try and cushion companies affected by the pandemic and those that have not been able to settle the tax dues for 2019 and 2020. As the GTN's Alan Chouachi now explores, companies are being given in some cases a grace period of up to seven years to settle their tax obligations with the state. The Tunisian government explained that this payment advantage will include companies which have not yet concluded payment schedules for their tax debts for 2019 and 2020. Prime Minister Hisham Shishi said the new tax facilities are part of the economic rescue plan. The measure is part of the economic rescue plan which was developed with our social partners. The government's willing to support companies to overcome this difficult period. We will save the affected SMEs, protect jobs and save the country's economy. Tunisian entrepreneurs have welcomed the state initiative. However, many business owners believe the government was too slow to react to the economic crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic has devastated many sectors and affected nearly all private companies. The role of the state is decisive. The government was absent for more than a year since the start of the health and the economic crisis. The recent measures will help companies improve liquidity. According to the National Institute of Statistics and the National Organization of Entrepreneurs, more Tunisian firms face specter of bankruptcy due to the COVID-19-induced economic crisis. More than 60% of enterprises, or 450,000 companies in Tunisia, are threatened with bankruptcy. More than 70,000 SMEs have definitely closed. The numbers are shocking. Hundreds of thousands of workers have lost their jobs. The new government measures in favor of companies are important, but we need more support and incentives. In addition to the tax payment advantages, the Ministry of Finance has also launched a new support mechanism. More than 500 SMEs will benefit from the endowment line of support for the financial restructuring this year. As businesses are forced to stop operations, the Tunisian government has issued several tax incentives to mitigate the economic and social impact of the crisis. Authorities assert that the relief program for SMEs affected by the pandemic will protect up to 200,000 jobs. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Away from the African continent now, the tech firm Huawei has wrapped up its annual developer conference in Shenzhen. It's unveiled six breakthroughs there in the cloud computing space. At that particular conference, Richard Yu, he's a CEO of Huawei's cloud and consumer business group, said that Huawei's future will revolve around its cloud and its computing tech. Huawei will also invest another $220 million in its fertile soil plan at an open sourced developer program. We are building a comprehensive industrial ecosystem from open sourced hardware to open sourced software. 
they could be applied by governments, telecom operators, transportation, and energy supplies. The ecosystem could meet the increasingly diversified demand for computing. We hope all developers can join us to help facilitate a more diversified computing industry, as well as artificial intelligence. I'll leave it there for the time being, but I'll be back at the top of the hour. In global business, we'll be focusing on the French energy giant Total. It's decided to suspend operations in the $20 billion gas investment in northern Mozambique, given the ongoing and rather brutal insurgency taking place in that part of the country. The details coming up at the top of the hour. See you then. For now, back to Beatrice. Rama, thank you. And we still have more news for you here on the program. Here's what's ahead. Egypt's 3,500-year-old Liberation Square gets a new look. Its effects are surreal, but its existence is undeniable. Mother Nature is fighting back against a species that is destroyed. to raise our voices and uh, we know that climate change has already started and it's killing us. It hurts. Amid the tears and the grief, however, there is hope for resolution. We need to live in harmony with nature. We focus on the deeds, the deals and the people working to make a difference. This is Surviving Climate Change, only on CGTN. Tahrir Square is the largest square in Egypt and a key landmark in the capital, Cairo. It was called Ismailia Square after ruler Khedive Ismail, who built it in the early 19th century, but it was renamed Tahrir Square or Liberation Square after the 1952 revolution. But the square now has a new look, as Yasser Hakim reports from Cairo. Built in 1865, Tahrir or Liberation Square shot to fame as the focal point for huge demonstrations in two uprisings that toppled two presidents in 2011 and 2013. These historic events have left their mark on the area for some years. But the latest Royal Mummies Parade in its dazzling display across Cairo has attracted world attention to the square again, this time for its impressive facelift. The renovations that took place to transform the Tahrir Square into this glorious look has taken a lot of efforts, planning, preparations and three years of implementation. The longest period was spent on restoring and renovating this 3,500-year-old obelisk and four ancient rams around it. The construction work on the 45,000-square-meter area was done by the state-owned Arab Contractors Company. We uh, did agree, uh, the green area all over the uh, uh, Tahrir Square. Also, we make the uh, concrete uh, sidewalks and the granite sidewalks. Uh, also, we make the fountain which found in the center of the Tahrir Square uh, and the uh, obelisk which we put it on uh, the center of the Tahrir Square. Uh, the renovation of the obelisk is done by the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities. Uh, but we did the construction which we, uh, the, the obelisk put it on it. The lighting was developed by the state-owned Sound and Light Show Company. The famous Egyptian museum in Tahrir Square and the surrounding historical buildings and streets have had a share of the upgrade as well. Besides the COVID-19 pandemic, which slowed down work, the $10 million project faced several other challenges. First of it is that we all know that Tahrir Square is one of the squares which is crowded with people and uh, and cars and traffic. The second challenge is the obelisk, which is found in the middle of the square, over underground station. Uh, the third one uh, is the time. Uh, we finished all the square in three months, which required from our company, Arab Contractor, to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, 
there are about 1,700 uh, people, more than 300 uh, engineers, all are working together uh, to finish the, uh, the project in time. For years, Tahrir Square has been the symbol of struggle and liberation. With the new look, it's becoming a symbol of rebuilding, development and growth. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. Let's go straight to Egypt, where the first international competition in two years for Egyptian kayak champion Ali Hassan will be the Tokyo Olympics. COVID-19 travel restrictions have prevented him from traveling out of the country. Despite not having competed internationally for quite some time, Hassan is heading to Tokyo with an eye on winning a medal. Here's CGTN's Adil Mahroui. 24-year-old Ali Hassan lifts his kayak and heads to the Nile. Excitement fills his heart every time he sets his boat on the water surface. Last year, the COVID-19 pandemic deprived him from getting into the water for months after Egypt locked down all its sports activities. Since then, Ali learned to appreciate being able to practice his favorite sport. We've planned for an intense training program before the pandemic got cancelled. I had a training camp in Spain. From there, I should have headed to the World Championships. Unfortunately, the coronavirus forced us to stay in Egypt, and for the first three months, we had zero training, only a simple fitness program. This young man was among the first 10 athletes ever to practice kayak in Egypt. For 12 years, whenever he joined an international competition, his prime mission was not to finish last. In 2019, Ali became the first Egyptian to rank the 12th in the sea finals of the single kayak 200-meter race at the World Canoe Sprint Championship. I've set a target for myself, which was to participate in the Olympics. That was my utmost dream, to just be part of it. Now that I'm going, my eyes are on a medal. If I can't do that this year, then it will be my prime mission in the next Olympics. Tokyo is Ali's first Summer Olympics, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic, he goes there blindfolded. Travel restrictions have forbidden him from leaving for international events, so he'll only know where he stands among his Olympic competitors in Japan when it's too late. I can't tell if the pandemic was good or bad for us. When everything was on schedule, for athletes like us, we were heading to Japan at a poor technical level. When the Olympics got postponed, we had much more time to train and get ready. All what this Egyptian kayak champion can do is keep training and continue attempting to break his own records in the 200-meter race. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. Kenyan driver Carl Flash Tundo stormed into his first Africa Rally Championship Equator Rally victory in Naivasha on Sunday. On his very first outing with the Minty Motorsports VW Polo R5, the, the five-time Safari Rally winner thrived through wet conditions as he led the Kenyan round of the Continental Series from start to finish. The two-day event over the weekend saw Tundo win six of the 11 stages. South Africa's Guy Botteril extended his lead on the ARC log with 50 points, but candidly admitted his Toyota R5 car 